excited to get this webinar kicked off um, and introduce Allison Nesbitt, AKA Dr. Doodle. Woo! Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. So before we get started, do we get to see the puppers? And yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about Dr. Doodle? How this come to be? <laughs> So my husband and I are both, uh, well now he's, he's a doctor, I'm a medical student, um, but he begged and begged me to get a dog during school and I said absolutely no way, we're both in school, it can't happen, and here we are. <laughs> um, so this is Dijoxin, he is named after the heart medication, um, and he is a trained therapy dog, so he's very well behaved, which fits the lifestyle of two medical professionals. Right. Um, and one of my friends was like, well, you have to make a, a Instagram page for him. And um, so I did. And now he has a little bit of a following and just a, it's been a really fun way to like, connect with uh, people. <laughs> and then, of course, with you guys, that's how this got started. And that bandana is the cutest thing ever. And Dijoxin clearly wanting some some love from Mama right now. Yeah. Uh, before before they started, I had a chance to go on and look at the Instagram. You have more ridiculously cute photos yeah. uh, than anything. So love it. Um, and glad Dijoxin is here to join us today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but to be respectful of your time in the audience uh, with us today, you know, I want to spend the next 20 minutes really diving in and giving you an opportunity to share your story of the last couple years of medical school. Um, so kind of where are you at today? Um, give us the, the quick kind of backstory on where you're at. Yeah, so um, I uh, actually, I went to the Lake Erie, or I'm going to the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, as I mentioned, my husband uh, is a year ahead of me. So he's uh, in his intern year in interventional radiology in Detroit. Um, so he, um, I applied early acceptance to LECOM, um, didn't have to take the MCAT, it was an awesome situation. And he applied the year before um, and was accepted. Lecom was the only school he applied to. And so it, that kind of fell into our laps. Um, we were going to try to apply together and then didn't have to. So I'm now in the third month of my fourth year, um, which is super exciting. Uh, of course, ERAS opened a couple of days ago. So that's a little nerve wracking. I'm working on my personal statement and getting those letter, letters of rec in. Um, the, Anxious filled time too, guys. First yeah. year is scary, but also fourth year is too. So you're not alone. Um, it's it's all a journey, absolutely. Definitely a different phase of the journey, right? As you kind of step into the last part of your medical school journey, but then residency is looming. Um, but it's neat also that you have a partner who is in a sense one step ahead, right? So that you kind of learning and seeing um, from him as he goes. but. Why don't we then, so, you know, fourth year medical student, you're at a place where you can kind of reflect, step back and look at the last four years of, of medical school. Um, so why don't we rewind it real quick and go back to the first couple of years and, you know, really leading up to step one or even just starting medical school, as I, I know some of the audience today is first year med students. How did you navigate the, the overwhelming amount of information um, that's, that's thrown on you as a first year? And how did you figure out how to learn and, and things of that nature? Take us back in time. Yeah, so I think the key phrase there is learning how to learn. Um, you guys are probably a couple weeks in if you're just starting this year. Um, and first year is like, they, everyone says it, it's like drinking from a, a water hose and that's exactly what it is. But um, just focusing on the first year as like building your foundation. I think that's the best advice I could give to someone with first year is, you know, you don't build a skyscraper in a day. Um, and having a solid foundation is so important to the rest of your career um, because every new cycle of um, the season that you're in is gonna be different. So next year I'll be an intern and I'm gonna feel like a first year again. And I'm gonna you know, remember those skills that I built in the first, first, first year um, and um, how it is diving into something new. So first year definitely Build your foundation. It's okay if you feel overwhelmed. It's so overwhelming. I had someone message me the other day and was like, how are we supposed to learn anatomy in 10 weeks? I don't know. I don't remember how I did it, <laughs> um, but you do it and you survive. Um, I think a, another key aspect of this is, you know, the title of this is 
uh, tips for thriving in medical school. Um, but sometimes thriving has a different de definition depending on the day. Um, Sometimes it is, you know, that traditional sense maybe of what we're used to as uh, people in academics is, you know, getting uh, an A on that exam. And, um, and sorry, <laughs> perks of having a dog on a mark just found a toy that is very loud. <laughs> um, so sometimes it is, you know, you get that A and it's the traditional sense of, you know, the success that we think of. Um, but sometimes, honestly, it's going home and surviving the day. Sometimes thriving is just surviving. Um, I've cried. I'm a crier. I say that <laughs> to everyone on the internet. Okay. And I have cried more than I ever thought possible or more than I thought I ever would. Um, but some, so some days for me, it's getting home without crying. And that's okay. That's the way it is. Yeah. Well, you know, going back in time, I definitely remember first year of med school for me, it was just ridiculous overwhelming in in the respect of like you said drinking from a fire hose so much information so little time um, and it's just stressful it's exhausting and and it can be brutal in that in that way so let's talk about time management a little bit what did you do um, regarding figuring out how to balance time yeah and then of course for all of these guys you know you throw a pandemic on top of that and <laughs> it's a whole new situation so an, a key aspect of being at home studying, um, as many of you probably are, time management is so important. And um, so I was a traditional lecture student. I spent eight hours a day in lecture and I would go home and study and then wake up and go to lecture again. But my husband was actually in a problem-based learning pathway, which meant that he did a lot of his studying at home. Right. Um, so the technique that he started using, and of, of course I started using it on the weekends too, or in the evenings when I came home, um, it's called the Pomodoro technique. And mm -hmm. basically you spend 25 minutes on and then five minutes off. And that's your time to, you know, think about something else, refresh your brain. Um, I actually typically do 50 minutes on and then 10 minutes off. So I'll sit and know that I have to be focused for 50 minutes. You know, the phone's in another room. Sometimes, um, it's turned off. Um, I also use a, it's an app called freedom that blocks mm -hmm. social media. Yep. And then in that 10 minutes, you know, I can feed the dog, I can let him outside or, you know, get some laundry folded. And that way throughout the day, you're doing little things that are keeping you productive and also turning your mind off for just a little bit of time because, you know, it's a marathon and, and keep keeping moving is, is a huge part of it. And okay. sometimes those are like 12 or 14 hour days, um, but majority of time they're not. And that's another uh, awesome aspect of, of the timer that we use is that it tr keeps track of how long you've been studying. So when you hit that 10 hours, you know, there's kind of decision, do I go two hours more or, you know, am I done for the day? Is it better for me to spend the next two hours just relaxing, turning off? I'm refreshed for the next day or you know can I push through and get another hour or two in yeah no, that's great and I think the you know Pomodoro you mentioned that you use an app um, potentially for blocking social media I know there's apps for the time tracking as well which is just you know it's really easy to sit down and just want to grind and study and and keep at it and you know you you never feel like you've probably accomplished enough but being able to turn off and take those breaks and, and kind of give your space to, for the mental clarity is, is so important um, so let's talk a little bit about resources. What did you use in the first couple of years of medical school to kind of help you through your journey? Um, so of course I use Pythonic. <laughs> That's where I'm here today. Um, I'm absolutely an audio visual learner. So I, that memory tag is so huge for me and it was so crucial to my, my success. I don't think I would have passed school without Pythonic or Sketchy Medicine. Um, so so it was awesome to discover these programs because it was like, okay, I'm not a crazy person that like <laughs> when I think of Von, Jer Von Jerky's disease, like that's what I think of it as. And that there was other people that thought like me. And it was just so encouraging to find that community. And then, um, you know, just so, so crucial to my success. I also use uh, an iPad with a smart pencil. Um, mm -hmm. And I took all of my notes on notability in that way so again with, with the visual physical learning right okay so and i'm assuming first aid as well yes 
and you know in i guess we'll kind of get to the whole step complex um arena but were there other other resources that you used beyond picmonic and sketchy or do you even want to talk about how you used those together what you used for what or when you started using each yeah one? so i also um flashcards are huge for a lot of people a lot of people use anki yep. um i actually use uh, quizlet and yep. there was a lot of uh community um Right. Like, at because there's so it's a very big school so there was a lot of um like group quizlets or group onkies that were used so i use that a lot and then um as far as sketchy versus picmonic um i got into picmonic really with biochemistry because those things are just so like out there like how yeah. how do you remember the name of the enzyme you don't um, so like with the glycogen, glycogen storage diseases, lysosomal diseases, that okay. were huge for me. Um, I actually reviewed some the other day and, and that's, you know, that's again, back to that foundational building. I came across something and I was like, how did I remember that before? Like, what's the enzyme? And I went back to Picmonic and remembered everything, yeah. you know, the tall faces that are associated with certain, like, it's just like it's so crucial with that foundation and then to be able to come back to it, you know, three years after I built that, cause we started uh, with biochem um, is awesome. So you actually started using Picmonic in your first year? Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely. We started with biochemistry and I think they uh, introduced the diseases later in the course. Like at first it was a lot of the basic stuff, but yeah, right away, I think I used it. And same with Sketchy, um, that I used a lot more for micro and form. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really, you know, I'd say I was split 50-50 with what, how I use either of those. Yeah, that's great. You know, if if there was a tool that existed for the lysosomal storage diseases, Picmonic might have never come about. Because it was it was those enzymes, right? Metachromatic glucodystrophy, aryl sulfatase, beta glucose reversidase. And I was just like, I couldn't keep them straight. Um, so that was really one of the first set of diseases that was uh, just absolutely killer when I was studying for STEP. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, prepping for the big exam, you know, step one, Comlex. Were there other things that you did going into your second year, um, you know, first year kind of setting that foundation, learning how to learn, figuring out, you know, time management, but going into second year, the tools you used or any, anything regarding preparation for boards? Uh, yeah, so I didn't start prepping, neither of us did, um, my husband or I, um, until January of second year. So, you know, five to six months out. Right. Yeah. First year is not the time to, you know, start diving into first aid. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's, it's very tempting because that's the goal, you know, that's the standard. And of course, now there's the pass fail for you guys uh, change, which is different than my experience. Um, but First year is about building that foundation. I, I would compare, um, you know, first, second, and third year to my three months of medicine that I had started with rotations. So, you know, picture me in, in the hospital for the first time. I started on internal medicine, which is a, it's a, it's a lot to start with. It is. And um, just completely lost. I, I didn't know where the bathroom was. Like, I didn't even know the basics. And that's how, probably how you guys are feeling right now, you know. I don't know the basics. I don't, this is all so much, so overwhelming. Um, and then second year is kind of like my second month on medicine. I, you know, kind of knew what was going on. I knew I was more familiar with the faces, more familiar with what the floors were. <laughs> um, and just knowing, okay, this is what's expected of me. And then third year is really about, you know, you're doing it. So, you know, you're transferring that knowledge into, into real life to transition from preclinical to clinical. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, third year, you're, you're finally applying your knowledge, which is huge. It's so, it's so refreshing to know that what you spent the last two years slaving over is finally right. applicable, but also uh, there's the realization that there's so much more to know, which is totally fine also. It's all, that's, you know, that's the beauty of medicine, that it's, there's so much, you can't know everything. And in fact, the more that you realize that the less you know, the better, um, just because there's just so much. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of it. You can't know everything. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So, you know, it's, it sounds like, I mean, between first year learning how to learn second year, really, um, starting to, to dig in and build off those foundations, understanding conceptually, then you've got the boards, then you're into clinicals. It's a big shift and a change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Even going into fourth year, have, have there been any significant changes or shifts in your, your strategies or things that you've done or even just how you've had to start thinking about what's next and choosing a residency? Yeah, so I think the really awesome part of fourth year is like you've finally been exposed to everything. And I know some people go into school knowing like, okay, I want to be a pediatrician. And, you know, maybe in fourth year, you still want to be a pediatrician, but it's okay to, you know, realize maybe I like nephrology a lot. I don't know. <laughs> I never would want to be a nephrologist, but you find your, you find your place. And I think that's what's awesome about fourth year is I just became so passionate and realized, you know, this is what I love. This is what I want to do. I'm really interested in nutrition. Um, from, you know, looking into how I can explore that through residency and um, just learning about how different programs approach their teaching methods. I think it's all very exciting. It's a, it's a way of seeing how other people do it. Now that you've seen it all, right. you can see how people do it differently. Right. So to that end, you know, becoming a doctor is obviously a marathon, right? Like not just getting into medical school, the four years of medical school, and then beyond into residency. Um, so let's talk a little bit about staying sane, finding balance um, and routines that work for you as I know it's so, so critical. Yeah, so um, we had exams always on Mondays. Okay. We spent whole weekends living away. Um, and then Monday morning was time to shine. Um, and I use Mondays um, to kind of reset and prep myself for the week. Um, I didn't study at all on test days. After the exam, that was the time to to take a break. Um, I actually love grocery shopping. So that was kind of a release. I know some people like would go <laughs> grocery shopping with like earbuds in and like jam out to some music while they're shopping. Um, so that was really awesome. And then also spending time with friends on those days that had, you know, experienced the same thing that I had and were, you know, we would allow ourselves to talk, you know, maybe reflect on the exam a little bit. But other than that, it was like, no talk about school. Like, um, let's taking a real day for a break. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think that's, I mean, it's kind of thematic in a way between short intensive study sessions and a break or whether it's okay, you know, days leading up to an exam, but then followed by a break and really just giving yourself the, the time and ability to, to refresh, to relax, to reset. Um, but so, so many of us constantly just have that, that, you know, internal feeling of we got to keep going, we got to keep studying, we got to keep moving. So it's, it's hard to sometimes force yourself to take a break. But, you know, to that end, burnout is real, right? Medical school is exhausting and it's stressful. So, you know, are there other things that within that mindset of, of kind of health and wellness that you found to be really beneficial for yourself or your partnership over the last couple of years? So honestly, getting a dog was really helpful. <laughs> I, um, I know other, and, and there's lots of research on this. Um, I actually, there's an article I've read about um, some, a study on people, some older people in uh, Italy that they gave uh, one part of the group a canary, the other part a plant, and the other part of the group nothing. And the outcome of the mental wellness of the people with the canary and the plant was better than those who had nothing. So I think that contributes to like caring for someone that's outside of that medicine realm. Um, so, you know, get your, I don't know, I mean, you know, we can talk further about getting a dog in medical school. It's not for everyone, um, but plants definitely, I would say, you know, getting a little plant, something to take care of that, that can contribute. We have a lot of plants in our house. I don't know what that says, but. <laughs> that's great. Well, I try to keep some plants alive here in Phoenix, Arizona, but it's like 115 yeah. out. Nothing survived. So I don't know about my green thumb. It's not working <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, you, you know, I, I think between, not to say distractions, but I mean, a puppy is like the most beautiful distraction in the world. Um, are there other things when it comes to nutrition uh, that really were helpful for you? I mean, you said you love shopping and it sounds like cooking and nutrition is important to you, but but what else did you do in order to, to kind of take that aspect of, of eating healthy, but also knowing that you have no time throughout the week? Yeah. What are you so doing that time? I'm on the meal prep train. Um, Got a meal prepper. I think, <laughs> I think, you know, it's definitely something to get used to. And it's hard if you enjoy like a lot of uh, like different things every day, because I don't love eating leftovers either or eating the same thing every day. Um, 
but prepping and having food in your refrigerator, even if it's one of those like microwave meals, frozen vegetables are just, you know, a life hack because a lot of times you can't eat the vegetables and fruits before they go bad, but frozen is better than canned and canned is better than nothing. Um, so, uh, you know, prepping ahead and having the food in your apartment at your house um, so you're not tempted to drive by Taco Bell and just you know, throw back a couple burritos because that's not going to do well for you in the long run. Um, and just learning how you can feed your, um, feed your body as well as your mind because this is something, you know, you're never going to really be in a position in your career where you have you know, plenty of time to cook a gourmet meal. So building these skills, um, I think on my CV, I have culinary literacy as an interest, <laughs> which is really a fancy way of being like knowing how to cut things up faster um, and being quicker in the kitchen uh, to save time. So I think having food on hand um, and not being tempted to eat out because that, that doesn't go well for your lungs either. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, as we start to approach the, the 30 minute mark, I encourage the audience uh, in attendance today to, to write in with some questions. I see a few that have already started to pop in, uh, but I'm going to rapid fire some real quick at you, Allison. So uh, favorite meal to cook? Ooh, um, we've been eating a lot of shrimp lately. Like yeah. if you buy frozen shrimp, it's super easy to thaw quickly, you know, mm -hmm. throw it in some pasta, throw it on some salad. Um, little Asian fusion going on. Um, yeah, shrimp. Shrimp. I, will, I wouldn't have guessed that one. Yeah, it's low calorie, quick. Love it, love it. All right, how about uh, favorite Pokemonic character? Ooh, you know, the first one that comes to mind is the uh, Homer Simpson for Homer Sissinuria. That okay. one is like, yeah. I think that was the original one and I really can't think of that disease. <laughs> Homer Simpson, which I never watched those cartoons, but you know, that's what he is to me. Love it. All right. Well, Heather, looks like you're jumping back in. I see a couple questions popping up. Why don't I go ahead and get started? Uh, Allison, one of the questions here for you is, it, uh, and I think the gist of what's being asked is between Picmonic and Sketchy, um, or even now Pixar Eyes, right? There's a couple different different visual mnemonic learning systems in the market today, which is fantastic. 10 years ago when I was in med school, that wasn't the case, right? So how do you, you know, when you're using different systems that have different characters or representations, mm -hmm. how do you keep them separated in your mind? Or are you saying specifically use one system, like use Sketchy for micro, use Picmonic for this, use, how, how do you think about the overlap of characters and, and making sure that you're not creating any like dissonance in the mind? Yeah, that was definitely a concern for me too. Um, I think it's different for everyone. I know a lot of people use Sketchy only or people use Picmonic only or like I use both. Um, I would say, honestly, one thing I loved about Picmonic is that all of the drawings are by the same artist, it feels like. Like um, I know with some of the sketches, it, there's like different, I don't, and it's not quite, I don't know how to describe it, but there's a little bit different artistry between those. So the consistency was really good for me. Um, and like I said, I really use Picmonic for biochemistry. So, you know, maybe those diseases are like separated, organized in my, mm -hmm. in my right. brain way. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think you, eventually you learn to separate, just like you would learn to separate the diseases themselves. Right. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And one of the ways that I would frame it is, each word or each key fact is being tied to a character association, right? Penicillin becomes a pencil villain or warfarin becomes a war fairy. Even if you're using different systems, you're still building this visual language. And, and even though the drawing or artistic style might be different, you know, I still think you, you end up kind of learning this visual vocabulary that you can recognize pictorially because the, the pictorial, like our ability to remember pictures is so much greater than just words. Um, so even though it is a concern and can be a little bit challenging, I think it, it outweighs the, the con of not using uh, it altogether. Um, how did you balance, so another question, uh, how did you balance board prep and class in second year and how to prepare well for boards? Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's a challenge. That's when in, you know, in January, February hits, that's when, you know, those, that extra time on the weekends, you just, 
I don't really, you just <laughs> do it. You just, you know, you got to sacrifice. I think we missed 10 weddings in our three years of, of school together. So yeah. really giving up those vacations and extra time. I also um, used my, one of my electives months, we had an option to use it as a study month instead. So um, I actually took a study month um, for my exam, which really helped with my prep and um, helped me focus. I know some people are better at balancing that. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, when you're thinking about just keeping up with coursework, but also starting to lean into boards. Um, and one of the things I think a lot of students we talk to say is, you know, in, in your second semester of second year, just start using QBanks, right? And at least applying them to the sections that you're learning in class so that you really start getting in that mindset of doing board right. stuff. Right, just the, that's, and that's a big thing is starting with questions. Um, I think it's so important. And again, this is something that you learn as you do more questions and board style questions aren't always the same as what you're gonna see on your school exams, but approaching right. those board questions the same way every time. So whether that's you reading the entire question, um, you know, phrase, and then the actual question, what they're asking for, and then the answer choices, and then going back and looking. Some people read the very last line of the question, and then go through the answer choices, and then read all the other background information. So developing that system and doing it the same way every single time is so important to make it through the, that eight-hour exam. Right, that consistency is, is really important. It's, it's building habits, right, in so many ways of whether it's the routine or taking breaks or um, meal prepping, those little things though, over time, help you be a lot more efficient and effective. So, uh, One of these other questions, and Heather, you can chime in, but how do you determine what is important to focus on when you're studying since there's a lot of materials to cover? Um, so as far as medical school itself is concerned, there was, we always had objectives. I think mm -hmm. that's pretty standard for most schools is to know what the objectives are. And then of course, through the lecture, a lot of lecturers are good about saying, you know, this is, this is what's most important for you to take away from this. Um, this is what you should be focusing on. Um, and then as far as boards are concerned, of course, there's like first aid, which is the holy grail. And it's not the only thing to look at. There's a lot of, a lot of different um, preps that goes into board prep, but um, if it's in first aid, you should know it. I agree. And if it's in first aid, then there's probably a pick monitor for it, so. <laughs> and you can see what page it's on, right? Yeah, it's true. Um, well, I know that we're now, it looks like at 530, at least uh, on the West Coast. So I want to be respectful of your time in the audience here today. I appreciate um, you joining above and beyond.